The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 46th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving the city of Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher... Let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, you could not have blessed us with a more beautiful fall day. We praise you for the beauty of your creation, for claiming us as your children, for calling us together to worship you in spirit and in truth. On this celebration Sunday, we give thanks for this body of Christ here in this place, this family of St. Philip. We thank you for each and every member and visitor and all those who share and participate in our ministry. You have been so good to us. So, so good to us. We ask that you would inspire us, motivate us, and equip us with all that we need to return thanksgiving and praise to you, to worship you, to love, and to serve our neighbor in unrelenting fashion. Thank you so much, God, for all of your grace and all of your mercy. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My sermon text for today is the first lesson coming to us from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. My sermon title for today is based on verse 5, where it reads, They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. So my sermon title for this morning is Keep Pouring. Keep Pouring. Today's text is the first miracle of at least five performed by the prophet Elisha. Over the course of the next couple of chapters here in 2 Kings, During the 9th century B.C., that is 900 years before Christ, in the northern portion of the nation of Israel. If this story itself sounds familiar to you, it may be because it echoes a very similar incident or occurrence at the hands of Elisha's mentor and fellow prophet Elijah back in 1 Kings chapter 17. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets, verse 1 opens up, cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. He feared the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. What a despairing scenario. The breadwinner in the family has died. And the family remains behind, not only grieving and mourning the loss of a loved one, but also impoverished and lacking the necessary resources. Death itself is tragic, painful enough, but to compound it with severe financial hardship is crippling. They had no insurance in those days, no societal safety net, so they are at the mercy of the creditor who is coming to take the two children, the two sons, into slavery. One cannot help but feel heartbroken for this newfound widow, 
who is now about to be bereft of her two offspring as well. What do you do when you lose three-fourths, 75% of your family? What do you do when you are left utterly alone? What do you do when your likely choices going forward are starvation or perhaps prostitution? Do you know what the real stinger in the first verse is, my friends? We haven't even addressed it yet. Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. You know that he revered the Lord. This man is from the company of the prophets. His job, his career, his life's calling was as a prophet, a spokesman of the Lord. He served the Lord. He feared the Lord. He revered the Lord. He was a vessel of the Lord, no doubt used far and wide in ministry, and he dies not wealthy and affluent, not middle class and sufficient, not even breaking even. He dies rather a pauper, destitute, in debt. He who gave his whole life to God dies owing other people. He whose family no doubt suffered because of his frugal, simple life of obedience now are left to pay the piper. And the price is slavery. Where is God? Is he presiding over such calamity? Will he not reward faithful service? Will he not, at minimum, protect the offspring and life partner of his servant? The prosperity gospel, which runs so rampantly over our landscape today, the health and wealth gospel, which promises wealth in return for reverence, seems not to exist here in 9th century B.C. Israel. Perhaps they didn't get the memo. What do you do when you serve God faithfully, die in debt, and leave your family vulnerable? Surely a God who is both benevolent and just will not allow such an atrocity. Or will he? Elisha replied to her, verse 2 continues, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Part of what we do as followers of Christ is to help identify and point out in others their gifts. How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Nothing at all except a small jar of of olive oil. This scene is truly sad, truly despondent, when you can only identify a smidgen of resources in the face of overwhelming need. Elisha said, go around, ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Not Go around and ask all your neighbors for jars full of olive oil. But go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. You have, practically speaking, nothing. Or almost nothing. And you are told to go ask your neighbors for their nothing. Jars full of nothing. And when you add it all up, you know what you'll have? A whole lot of nothing. Anybody ever been here before? Been asked to exert a whole lot of effort and energy and hope for nothing? Then go outside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled, set it to the side. Apparently, whatever is about to happen, if anything, is not meant for public consumption. Whatever is about to happen, if anything, is meant solely for this widow and these about-to-be-orphaned boys. She left Elisha, in verse 5, and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the empty jars to her, and she kept 
pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She had nothing but a small jar or vessel of oil. She gathered many empty jars, empty vessels, and began pouring the meager contents out. As long as there was an empty container, vessel, or jar, the oil kept pouring. Only when every single jar was full did the oil stop flowing. The miracle here is not obvious. Several gallons of oil didn't magically appear out of the air. Rather, the small measure of oil just keeps pouring. As long as she pours, the oil keeps flowing. It only stops when there are no more containers. What appears as a very small amount, practically nothing, is seemingly an unending reservoir. At the end, she went and told the man of God, that is Elisha, who had previously told her, go and use your nothing, combine it with other people's nothing, for seemingly a whole bunch of nothing. And he said, go sell the oil, pay your debts, you and your sons can live on what is left. There is enough to get out of debt. There is enough to avoid slavery. There is enough to sidestep deprivation, destitution, and degradation. There is enough to emerge unscathed. There is enough to live on. How often, as people facing severe suffering, do we say, I have nothing here at all except this one small thing. How often as people facing trial and tribulation do we respond, I possess nothing except for what's barely even worth mentioning. We can spend a lifetime of faithfulness, of revering, fearing, and loving God, of serving those in need, suddenly face a crisis of epic proportions involving a profound loss which shakes us to our very foundations only to realize that we have little money, little resources, little courage, little faith, little hope, little sanity, little energy, and little health. We feel that we are down to our last hope that we are hanging on by a mere thread, that the knot at the end of our rope is beginning to fray and unravel, and that despite how much we have given over a lifetime, that we are about to die owing yet even more. And yet, the Word of God today proclaims to us that as long as there are empty jars... The oil continues flowing. The oil somehow produces of itself, and it does so until there is not a jar left. Verse 5 says, until that point, this woman kept pouring. And no matter how much she poured, the oil kept flowing. The reason, my friends, that we are hesitant to pour is because we fear the resource is finite. The reason that we don't pour more freely, that we don't keep pouring, is because of the fear that it will run out. It's a rationing mindset which this world gives us. But what if the oil does in fact keep flowing? What if love is limitless? What if faith is forever? What if grace is growing? What if money is multiplied? What if resources are replicated? What if energy is exponential? What if the fear of there is not enough and there won't be enough is shattered and replaced with the honest to goodness assessment that there will always be enough? What if the sentiment we won't make it is replaced with the truth we will make it? What if the response I have nothing except this jar of oil, is replaced with, I have a jar of oil. 
What if we went around asking people for their nothings too? If we went around collecting a bunch of empty containers, vessels, and jars into which we pour faith, hope, love, and healing, and compassion, and provision, and encouragement, which will continue to run as long as there are empty jars. What if we keep on pouring? And what if our supply never runs out? What if our cup, in fact, runneth over? As Psalm 23 says, what if, in fact, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, runneth over on our laps, according to Luke 6? I serendipitously stumbled recently upon a quote from St. Francis, that medieval servant of God, the poor, and animals, which I had never encountered before. St. Francis said, Start by doing what is necessary. Then do what is possible. And suddenly, you will find yourself doing the impossible. Start by doing what is necessary. Then do what is possible. And suddenly, you are doing the impossible. This widow in dire straits did what was necessary. She gathered numbers of empty jars. Then she did what was possible. She began pouring that little bit of oil. Suddenly she was doing the impossible. She kept pouring because the oil kept replenishing itself. So keep pouring, my friends. Keep pouring love. Keep pouring hope. Keep pouring faith. Keep pouring support. Keep pouring encouragement. Keep pouring gentleness. Keep pouring compassion. Keep pouring empathy. Keep pouring generosity. Keep pouring joy. Keep pouring justice. Keep pouring righteousness. You keep pouring peace. Keep pouring reconciliation. Keep pouring life more abundant. Keep pouring healing. Keep pouring restoration. Keep pouring assistance. Keep pouring helping hands. Keep pouring humility. Keep pouring virtue. Keep pouring gratitude. Keep pouring appreciation. Keep pouring. Keep pouring. Keep pouring. Oh, we've got some empty jars lined up in this place today and your source is still flowing. The truth is you did what was necessary a long time ago. You did what was possible a while back. And now you've been doing the impossible for a little while now. With God, with God, all things are possible. And you are with God because God is with you. Somebody say, I'm still pouring. Somebody say, I'm still pouring. Somebody say, I'm still pouring. What are you doing? Good, because God is too. Amen.